That which begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe had a cause. This is known as the Kalam cosmological argument, and it is a consequence of the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. For evolutionists, this means also that the Big Bang is impossible. Well, this seems like a no-brainer, but I just had to investigate. Contrary to popular lore, when creationists define the first law of thermodynamics, they are only partially quoting it. The first law of thermodynamics is actually a more specific law, which states that the total energy of an isolated system is constant. Energy can be transformed from one form to another, but cannot be created nor destroyed. It is a more specific version of the law of conservation of energy, which states that the total energy of an isolated system remains constant. The operative word here is total. When the laws of thermodynamics were first stated, quantum the mechanics had not even been formulated yet. At the quantum level, particles do pop in and out of existence all the time. This is a level known as the Planck length, characterized by quantum foam. In the midst of this, there are several methods by which particles pop into existence from nothing. The two most well-known are the Casimir effect and Hawking radiation. These appearances of subatomic particles, however, do not violate the law of conservation of energy nor the first law of thermodynamics because they are inherently unsteady and disappear as suddenly as they appear. In the end, the total energy of the system is conserved and manifests no real consequence at the Newtonian level which is what the first law of thermodynamics actually addresses. In the early 20th century, Pasquale Jordan expanded on Einstein's general theory of relativity by noticing a relationship between stellar mass and stellar gravity. Essentially, he recognized that the two, overall, canceled each other out. When applying this same insight to the rest of the universe, physicists realized that with the apparently flat shape of the universe, the total energy in the universe comes to a grand total of zero. In 2009, Lawrence Krauss gave a presentation to the Richard Dawkins Foundation, wherein he presented the cosmological implications of a flat expanding universe. He later expanded on these ideas in his book, A Universe from Nothing. His ideas were predicated upon the fact that at the quantum level, even a perfect vacuum was not completely empty. There were still tiny energy fluctuations that, however detectable, averaged out to zero. From here, Krauss was able to extrapolate that even such a small fluctuation in energy could manifest an entire universe. The response of the scientific community was mostly disinterest. Richard Dawkins, in his afterword to the book, compares it to Darwin's origin of species in terms of its overall effect on science, but even Krauss considered such praise to be excessive. The creationist community, understandably, criticized Krauss for redefining the term nothing, the point being that even quantum fluctuations in a vacuum would be something. So even if his scenario was correct, he still hadn't created a universe from nothing. Krauss's response was to point out that the classic definition has not and cannot ever be observed, whereas his version of nothing is actually demonstrable. In the end, all of this debate rages over something that the Big Bang doesn't even claim. The Big Bang does not claim that the universe came from nothing. It simply states that at some point in the finite past, all matter and energy in the universe was in a very small, dense place. At this state, Physics as we understand it can make no comment of whether there even was a before the Big Bang. The smallest unit of time defined is the amount of time it takes light to travel the Planck length. We call this unit Planck time. It is equal to 10 to the negative 44 seconds, and it is also the limit to how far back we can understand the universe after the Big Bang. At this point, all energy is compacted to the size of the Planck length, but it is still there. So for all we know, there always was energy. At best, we can say that the universe, as we know, it began at the Big Bang, but we don't know what, if anything, happened before. As is often repeated, the Big Bang is not theorized to be an explosion, but a rapid expansion of space-time, in which case it would be more accurate to describe the Big Bang as the appearance of nothing from something, rather than something from nothing. So going back to the Kalam cosmological argument, we have never seen anything begin to exist. So premise one does not follow. We don't know if the universe began to exist, so premise two does not follow. If the universe did begin to exist, it began in a state which we cannot comment on, where none of conventional logic applies. So even then, a creationist has all of their work ahead of them in determining this supposed cause to be a consciousness. 
let alone God, let alone a six-day creation. This is also where the line between science and philosophy begins to blur, which is why the honest position here is to leave a question mark where creationism claims to have an answer. Asserting an answer where there is no evidence is dishonest. And another example of how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.